It is finally time for the 2023 North Carolina Tar Heels football season preview. Hey, huddle up. Let's talk about it. You don't want none. You don't want none. Ready, break. What's going on, Tar Heel Nation? It's your boy, Russ. And I'm here with the 2023 North Carolina football season preview. But before we get into that, I just want to encourage you, if you are a North Carolina fan, if you're from the state of North Carolina, or you just pull for the Tar Heels anywhere in the country, or just like college football in general, please like, share, and subscribe to this content. And by all means, push that notification bell so that it'll notify you every time that I make a video pertaining to our Tar Heels. So, without further ado, the North Carolina Tar Heels. They return off of a 9-5 campaign where they went 6-2 and two in the Coastal Division and were the last crowned Coastal Division champions. And they also made an appearance in the ACC Championship game where they unfortunately fell to the Clemson Tigers. I, myself, and my family were there, and it was not the funnest game to watch. However, North Carolina is returning a ton of talent, and there's a lot to be excited for. Even though they lost that game to Clemson, even though they lost the game to the Oregon Ducks that they should have won, that they had in the bag, they still return a ton of talent. So, obviously Carolina started 9-1, and and they won a ton of football games in 2022 uh, that were one-score games. And what set them apart from the first half was that in the beginning, they were winning those close games. And at the end of the tail end of last season, they started to lose those football games. They actually won, or excuse me, they lost three of their last four games by four points or less. So that was the difference between starting nine and one, being ranked number 13 in the nation, Drake may receive an all this Heisman talk, and then falling to nine and five on the year because you lost the ACC championship game, because you lost the bowl game to Oregon in San Diego. But Carolina has a ton to be excited about this year. So Athlon Sports currently has UNC rated as the number 25 team in their top 25 poll. And it's largely in part, obviously, to the return of Heisman candidate Drake May, who was the 2022 ACC Player of the Year. Now, UNC returns six starters for their new offensive coordinator, Chip Lindsey. And that obviously includes, like we just talked about, sophomore quarterback Drake May, who passed for 4,321 yards, 38 touchdowns to only seven interceptions. He had a 66.2% completion percentage, and he also led the team in rushing with 698 yards and seven rushing touchdowns. Now, as obvious, that's, that's a great feat. But does Carolina need Drake May, the six foot five, 220, 30 pound Drake May leading the team in rushing? No. So hopefully that was just a one off. Hopefully, as we talk about later, we can get some backs involved that can take that mantle off of him. So, so Carolina also returns senior and tight end Kamari Morales, who had 358 receiving yards with four touchdowns, along with junior tight end Bryson Nesbitt, who had 507 yards receiving with four touchdowns also. They also return their senior center, Corey Gaynor, who was a transfer from Miami, along with senior left guard, Ed Montalus, and senior left tackle, William Barnes. The question for that is gonna be, how does Carolina look on the right side of that line? You kind of already know what you're getting on the left side. Um, tons of experience, but you already know what you're getting. How does that right side hold up for Drake May? Now. Drake May did lose his top two wide receivers from a year ago in Josh Downs, who had 1,029 yards receiving with 11 touchdowns, and Antoine Green, who had 798 yards receiving and seven touchdowns. However, Mack believes that the team has addressed those concerns when they went into the transfer portal and they got Nate McCollum from Georgia Tech, who had 650 receiving yards last year without a good quarterback, I might add. And also Tez Walker from Kent State, who can absolutely take the top off of a defense. So if you look at these two guys, they kind of replace Josh Downs and Antoine Green almost identical. Now, are they going to have the same production? 
That remains to be seen. However, Mac thinks that the Tar Heels have the pieces in place to um, make uh, an impact on that offense. Let's not forget, you know, that especially Tez Walker, he's a Kent State transfer. He had 921 yards, receiving 11 touchdowns last year. That doesn't that that includes the seven catch. One touchdown, 106-yard game he had at number one Georgia. So this isn't just some guy who was beating up on, you know, mid-Atlantic conference opponents. He had a heck of a ball game against the national champion Georgia Bulldogs, and now he's a Tar Heel. So that's a ton to be excited about. Now, like we already talked about, UNC actually returns their top three tight ends. Um, we already talked about Kamara Morales and Josh Nesbitt. But don't forget about my man, John Copenhaver. He had 15 catches for 222 yards himself, and the guy is sneaky out of that tight end position. A lot of times you kind of overlook him thinking that he's just in, in there for blocking because he's in tight. Nah, John Copenhaver is a threat as well. I think one of the most exciting things to look out for this year is the running back room. Now, obviously, Carolina was plagued with injuries last year. Um, you know, you had the injury to Caleb Hood after he started looking really good. Um, you just had you just had a plethora of injuries that happened to the Tar Heels. But the one guy that remained healthy enough to stay in there, and he actually he actually proved to be a serviceable back, even though at one time he was like fifth on the depth chart, is my man Elijah Green. He returns uh, after rushing for 558 yards and eight touchdowns, um, and he actually proved to give Carolina a fairly decent option at the running back position. Um, but I'll, I'm going to be completely honest with you. Even though he's coming off a major knee injury, and if you get a chance, check out Jason Stables um, on Inside Carolina. He did a segment about the running backs, and I think that he's spot on. You know, British Brooks, even though he's coming back from a major knee injury, he looked really explosive in Carolina's spring game. And I think that he's got some intangibles that a lot of guys don't have. You know, a lot of people will, you know, they'll talk about the O'Marion Hampton and they'll talk about the Elijah Green. But British Brooks looked really explosive. He looks good, man. And, and just the fact that in that spring game, he did not have a knee brace on shows you how healthy he feels. Now, it remains to be seen if he can be a feature back. You know, he did it for two or three games uh, two years ago before his injury, um, but that remains to be seen if he can take that every day or every week pounding that a featured tailback is going to have to take in order to carry Carolina and take some of that heat off of Drake May. So I am personally extremely excited about British Brooks, and if you were to ask me personally, I think with what I've seen, I think that British Brooks should be the starting running back. Now, the second guy in there is a Marion Hampton. He's 6'1", 220 pounds. And I mean, my man is, he looks the part. Uh, you know, the problem with a Marion Hampton is, is last year as a freshman, it seemed like he kind of ran to the hole and his vision, trying to keep his pads as low as he could, it's almost like he put his head down and he ran to where he was supposed to run as opposed to seeing the field and making the appropriate cuts. So a lot of times he just got cut down, it was minimal gain, or he didn't have a lot of yak. And if you look at his PFF, his pro football focus, that was one of his problems is, is that, you know, he didn't make the first man miss very often. He's a huge guy, and he's not somebody that you really want to tackle in the open field because he's just a huge muscular dude, but he doesn't really have the vision unless he's developed that over this spring and summer. So it'll be interesting to see O'Mary and Hampton because he looks the part, man. And if he can put it all together, he could have a fantastic campaign this year and for years to come for the Heels. Another guy that a lot of people aren't really talking about is Caleb Hood. Caleb Hood was the feature back before he had that shoulder injury, and that's really his ordeal. Caleb Hood is a great athlete. He's got great hands. He's got a great body. I mean, the guy's 5'10", 5'11", he's 220, 225, and he is solid. That's a thick dude. But his issue is, is it seems like every time he gets hit, something gets injured in the shoulder or what have you, and he can't stay on the field. So that's going to be Caleb Hood's issue. He had 250 rushing yards last year, 
Um, and he did lead the running back room with 5.8 yards per carry. So if Caleb can stay healthy, you know, I think he's the first or second best back on the team. But the problem is, is he can't string together games because he keeps getting injured. Now, a lot of that is misfortune. I don't at all think that Caleb Hood is soft. You know, I think that he's just been misfortunate. But you've got to be able to stay in the football game and you've got to be able to produce week in and week out. So that's going to be something that Caleb has got to do. Um, and, and the running back room has got to get better because teams cannot continue to just pin their ears back and go after Drake May. Um, he's got to have somebody aside from himself that can really just be a legitimate running threat, and uh, that'll be interesting to see this year. I like British Brooks. Brooks. I'm a big British Brooks comp uh, fan, proponent. Um, I'd like to see him start the year. That is, of course, if he's healthy enough. Now, let's flip it over to the defensive side. The defensive coordinator is obviously Gene Chizik. He's returning seven starters on defense to include basically the entire front seven, um, and that's if you can you uh, consider senior Jack um, Kyman Rucker, who was UNC's best defensive player last year, especially Lyman. I'd say he's UNC's best defensive lineman. Um, so the defense bolsters returning starters. Junior defensive end Javari Ritzy, he had 48 tackles and a sack. Senior nose tackle Kevin Hester Jr., he had 49 total tackles. Senior defensive tackle Miles Murphy and senior defensive end Desmond Evans to round out basically your front four. Look, a lot of these guys have got the sink and put up. Desmond Evans was a five-star recruit. Miles Murphy was a high four-star recruit, if I'm not mistaken. Javari Ritzy was a high four-star, five-star guy. These guys have got to get more pressure on the quarterback. A lot of times last year when you watched that defensive line, it was almost like they stood straight up and they were just kind of playing patty cake with the offensive line guy in front of them. You know, they got to get a push. And athletes like Desmond Evans, the guy is 6'5", you know, 270 pounds, and he's lean somehow. He, he is just a dominant athlete that should be able to just impose his will on people. And we have not seen what Desmond Evans is truly capable of. I want to see these guys get stinking mean, man. I mean, that's really what we need. North Carolina in the 90s was known for its defense. Julius Peppers. I mean, dude, the defensive line is it was one of the strong suits before Mac Brown left for Texas. That's one of the reasons they were top 10 teams in 96, 97, going into 98. That's why that program was up, because the defense was so good. And now Carolina's defense is known to be soft. They don't come up and fill the hole the secondaries, man, that is not what Carolina's defense is supposed to be known by looking at the 90s. And even 2009, 2010, Quan Sturdivant, Bruce Carter, Charles Brown, these guys would come up and pop you in the mouth. And that's what the Carolina defense needs to bring back. Now, they do return two really good linebackers in Power Eccles, and Cedric Gray. Cedric Gray was an All-ACC performer last year. He had 144 tackles, one sack, and two picks. And my man Power Eccles, how cool of a name is Power for a linebacker. He had 103 tackles, two sacks, and one interception. So they do return both of those guys. And as much as I don't like the 4-2-5, which is basically what Carolina runs, if I had to pick two linebackers to hold it down, I think that they got two really good linebackers to do just that. Now, the defensive line has got to keep these, these offensive linemen from getting to the second level and shadowing their face so that they can come up and make tackles and fill the hole. That's going to be something that we got to see. I'd even rather Cedric Gray's tackles go down if the defensive line can get a push. Um, I think that's what Carolina needs in order for them to be effective and drastically improve the defense. Now, Talk about those dogs that Carolina so desperately needs. And even though this guy was out of position a lot and there was a couple of times he got burned for us, the one thing that I do like about Nickelback DeAndre Boykins is, even though he's undersized, my man will come up and pop you. And, and, and that's, all, that's all I ask. You know, that's all I ask. I'm sure that's all Gene Chizik is asking. You know, we just want a physical defense. We want physical guys that will come up and hit you in the mouth. 
And that's one of the things that Carolina secondary didn't do last year. I mean, you had five-star Tony Grimes. You had Storm Duck, who looked the part on the other side. And those guys just wouldn't come up and make a hit, man. You know, and it, it's something that uh, it's something that plagued Carolina's defense. It wasn't just the poorest play at the safety position. The corners were atrocious, you know. But fortunately, you had my man, DeAndre, who would come up and stick you every once in a while. And then he'd flex on you. You got to love that, man. That, that's what kind of football I want to see. That's what kind of football every Tar Heel wants to see. We want to see you come up and hit somebody in the mouth. So, Tony Grimes and Storm Duck, they're gone. And you know what? Hey, I appreciate your service, man. And uh, sometimes it's just it's better for these guys to think and move on and find something else. And, and by all means, best of luck to you in the future. You'll always be a Tar Heel, bro. But you just weren't getting it done. And I'm excited to get a couple more guys in there as opposed to just leaving the same dudes out there on the corners and getting beat every single year. So, <clears throat> that unproductive duo, no disrespect intended, man, I'm just stink stinking stating the facts, is Armani Chapman comes in from Virginia Tech, who should be a serviceable uh, corner. And then you got my man Elijah Huzzy from Eastern Tennessee State. And everybody, by all accounts, says that this dude is the aggressive corner that Carolina has been missing. That he will come up and he'll hit you, and he will play the football, and he will cause turnovers, and that is what we need. He's going to have a great opportunity to do some big things for the Hills. Another guy that I'm extremely excited about that Carolina just brought in is my man Antavius Lane from Georgia State. Now, Carolina played Georgia State last year, and he kind of caused a little ruckus. My man is a safety that will come up and hit you. And that's why his name, his nickname is Stick. I mean, does it get cooler as a safety than if people don't call you Lane or Antavius, they call you Stick? That's the kind of dog I'm talking about. That's, that's, that's what we need. So I'm super happy that Mac would go out and get somebody whose nickname is Stick. I mean, let's go, bro. I want to see you fill the hole I want to see you knock mouthpieces out of people's mouths. That's what we want to see from this defense, man. It's about time. These guys need to bow up. They got way too much talent, and they got way too much talent coming in. They need to be improved. And when we talk about two generational quarterbacks, probably the two best quarterbacks that Carolina's ever had, Sam Howe, and then you put probably the best, the, the one of the, Either the best or the second best quarterback in the country right now with Drake May, and he's probably going to the league next year. It is time for Carolina to put it together. That defense needs to be drastically improved, and they need to make a big jump this year, especially because it's probably Drake May's last year, man. It's time to put up or shut up. So Ben Kiernan, he's going to return. He led the ACC in uh, punt yards last year with 46.8. And then you can expect the Cincinnati transfer, uh, the senior Ryan Coe. He's probably going to get the nod for the place kicking duties. We'll see. But he is going to be competing against Noah Burnett, who was Carolina's place kicker last year. So <clears throat> that's basically your roster right there, man. And that's what we got coming in. And I think, like I said, there's a lot to be excited about. I'm hoping that Chip, Chip Lindsey can pick up right where he left off or right where uh, Phil Longo left off before he left for Wisconsin. Change it a little bit. Get that power running game going. Take a little bit of stress off of Drake May. And then also, I'm really excited to see Gene Chizik and his improvement in that Carolina defense because they have got to be much better. You cannot give up 61 points against App State. You can't give up 28 to Virginia and be competitive. That's just unacceptable. They have got to do better. And Gene needs to make it happen. He's, he's a great coach. But it is time to see that defense make a big step, take a big step forward. So without further ado, let's get into the 2023 North Carolina football season preview. And obviously, we start off with September 2nd, the North Carolina Tar Heels. 
face off against the South Carolina Gamecocks in Bank of America Stadium. And from henceforth, South Carolina will be known as South Carolina. And the Tar Heels will be known as, like we already are, Carolina, because there's only one Carolina, and it's UNC, the Tar Heels, the Carolina. So, huge game, bragging rights, recruiting purposes. They recruit basically the same areas, and South Carolina is constantly coming in to the Tar Heel State and poaching some of Carolina's best talent. Um, so this is a huge game as far as that is concerned. Now, UNC leads the all-time series 35-20 to with four ties, and UNC won 29 of the first 40 in the series. However, South Carolina has led the series 13-6 to since 1967, including, and I hate to say this, the last meeting in the 21 Dukes Mayo Bowl where South Carolina, with a running back slash wide receiver, punished a listless UNC team. I mean, I don't know if I've ever seen a Carolina team just look so not into a bowl game. And it was really hard to watch that 21 Dukes Mayo Bowl. I mean, because it just seemed like you had this one team with a six-string, you know, quarterback who is playing like their life depends on it. And you got a UNC team who's just like, I don't want to be here right now. And it was embarrassing. I think they beat Carolina 38-21. to Just an embarrassing football game, you know. Not indicative of how things should have been, should have went. Um, And that was just a rough season for Carolina in general. But I digress. So UNC needs to win this football game because obviously they need to reestablish the hope that Mac Brown started selling when he retook the job. It's time to put up. And how much how how much more exciting can it be than Carolina playing an SEC team at a neutral site for the first game of the year? This isn't this isn't FAMU, this isn't Florida A and M. You know, when you play a team like this, everybody they go a little bit harder in their in their reps. They're working hard. They're trying to make things happen so that they can be the best that they can possibly be in that game one. It's gonna be a 7:30 kick. The whole nation's gonna be watching. It's gonna be a big football game. Spencer Rattler comes back. Um, A lot of people were talking about this guy. I, for one, am not very impressed. Um, I'm not saying he's not a good quarterback. I would say he's an average SEC quarterback. I don't think that he strikes fear in me. Um, The only thing that I would say is Carolina has an unproven secondary at the ACC level right now. So it'll be interesting to see Spencer Rattler and Juice Wells, who is a stud, uh, going against that Carolina secondary. Uh, Juice Wells returns with 928 yards receiving and six touchdowns, and he had some big stinking football games against Tennessee and Clemson. So the dude can do it um, if he's given the opportunity. Um, He didn't play very well against Notre Dame, pretty quiet game, but uh, this will be an interesting matchup with UNC's secondary. So the Gamecocks themselves have a very good secondary. Um, I think it's Nick Emanwari. Uh, he's returning with DQ Smith at safety, and they also have Marcellus Dial and uh, nickelback David Spalding, and they had 15 picks last year. So we're talking about strength on strength. We're talking about Carolina's passing offense and South Carolina's secondary. You know, it's going to be strength on strength, and that'll be an interesting matchup to watch throughout the duration of the football game. Um, so ESPN matchup gives UNC a 64.4% chance at beating South Carolina. I have North Carolina winning this in a close one to start the season because I trust Drake May more than I trust Spencer Rattler. I think the defense does just enough to show their improvement during the offseason, and my Tar Heels beat the South Carolina Gamecocks and go to 1-0 to start the season and kick off what I think could be a big one. So September 9th, after the South Carolina game, Hey, there's no letdown here because the Appalachian State Mountaineers come into Chapel Hill and they will be looking like they always do to take down Big Brother. They finished last year 6-6, 3-5 in the Sun Belt. They did not go to a bowl game and UNC leads the all-time series 2-1. Now, App State's lone victory against Carolina was in Chapel Hill and that was back in 2019 in Sam Howe's first year. They came in and just 
just kind of started wrecking things. And uh, it was a game that we should not have lost. I think it's a game that Carolina overlooked, and they shouldn't have. Um, but who can forget that shootout last year in Boone? I don't know if I've ever watched a football game that made me happier and more upset at the same time because it was absolutely embarrassing. 63-61 to in Boone, North Carolina against a Sun Belt team was disgusting. In Carolina, they couldn't keep the lead. Drake May would drive them down the field. They'd have a big play. They'd take the lead. And then the defense would just have some bonehead play that would give App State the game back. And it just went back and forth the entire game. Nobody could stop anybody. Now, at the beginning of the season, I didn't expect many people to stop Carolina's offense. But to not be able to stop App State's defense and make them look like you know, some kind of world beaters was absolutely ridiculous. And it's something that they need to clean up, and they need to clean it up fast. Um, that was truly difficult to watch, and I was not very happy about being 2-0. and Didn't feel really good about where the Hills were last year, and they were undefeated at 2-0. and So they do have to replace quarterback Chase Bryce, and they replace a ton on defense. Um, they do return their two leading tacklers, uh, but they are not going to have the horses to compete with the Hills and Chapel Hill this year. Um, this cannot be a letdown game. I don't think that it will be. UNC, or excuse me, ESPN gives UNC a 87.5% chance of beating App State, and, and I, I agree with that number. I have the Hills starting the season 2-0, and and I have them beating App State fairly big. Now, <clears throat> September 16th, I think it's going to be a really exciting football game. you got an SEC game to start the, se- the season. You have an in-state rivalry, if you will, to be the second game of the season. And then you bring in, a, an, an, I would say right now, an above-average Big Ten team in a one-on-one series. And they get to come to Chapel Hill uh, for game one, and that's the Minnesota Golden Gophers. Last year they were 9-4, 5-4 and four, five and four in the Big Ten and they did go to their bowl game, the Pinstripe Bowl, and they beat the Q's 28-20. to Now, this is an exciting matchup in that UNC and Minnesota have never met on the football gridiron, which is real cool. I mean, all the years that these teams have been playing, they've never played each other. So this is the first time. It's going to be an exciting football game, Big Ten, on the ACC's turf. Now, I love this matchup. P.J. Fleck is a great coach. And um, you got that that Big Ten opponent on your own home field. So that's a fun football game to get excited for. Now they are replacing their starting quarterback, Tanner Morgan, and they're replacing their, all, their all-time leading rusher and running back, Muhammad Ibrahim, uh, who rushed for 4,668 yards. And they also have to replace their three interior linemen. So this should be a physical football game. That's what the Big Ten does. They try to run the football down your throat, especially a finesse team or what's known as a finesse team like Carolina. They're going to try to establish the run, and this will be a real good opportunity to see how Carolina's front seven and even that secondary that allegedly likes to come up and make contact, how they perform in this football game. Uh, Another interesting matchup is going to be UNC's linebackers and safeties against their six foot seven uh, senior tight end Brevin Span Ford. He had 497 yards and two touchdowns last year. They also return uh, two receivers that totaled for about 800 yards receiving and six touchdowns. Now, ESPN has UNC with a 66.9% chance of beating the Gophers in Chapel Hill, and I will agree with ESPN, and I got the Tar Heels winning three to nothing before the first conference game, and I think that Carolina wins this game Uh, by two touchdowns. I think that uh, it'll be that kind of football game. Now, exciting football game, the first ACC game of the season. Uh, September 23rd, Carolina will travel to Pittsburgh. Now, Pittsburgh last year was 9-4, 5-3 in the ACC, and they did uh, beat UCLA in the Sun Bowl 37-35 last year. UNC leads the all-time series 11-5. Now, the cool thing about this game is, as much as I don't like playing Pitt because I hate going to Heinz Field, it's always a half-empty stadium, and it takes a little bit away from the pageantry that you would expect in a college football game, which is why I love college football so much, is it's good that Carolina's not playing there in late October, 
November time frame when it's 15 degrees outside and it's a night game or a Thursday night game and nobody's, you know, I'm glad that they're not doing that. It's the end of September. The weather should be fantastic. And it's a good opportunity for Carolina to get on off on the right foot against a good quality ACC opponent. Uh, Pitt's going to be all right. They're going to be a pretty good football team. They got uh, Jerkovic, which is uh, Boston College's old quarterback. Jerkovic is from Pittsburgh, and he returns to lead the Pittsburgh Panthers. And uh, it'll be interesting to see what they can do uh, now that he's come back home, if you will. Now they did lose their uh, running back Israel um, Abani Kanda who rushed for 1,700 yards and 11 touchdowns to the NFL. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how they fill that void. They do have Sun Bowl MVP running back Rodney Hammond Jr. return, and he also returns with Kanata Mumpfield, uh, who had 551 yards, and Bub Means, who had 283 yards. So it's not going to be an easy game. Carolina's going to have the work put out for them, cut out for them, and they are going to have to handle business. Um, the defense, however, lost a ton of talent, including re- reigning defensive player of the year, Kalijah Kansi. Um, one of the interesting statistics, I think, is that Pitt leads the nation in sacks with 199 since 2019. That is stinking ridiculous. Just unbelievable. Now, once again, strength on strength. MJ Devonshire, Mark Weiss Williams, and AJ Woods lead a really good secondary. So Carolina is going to have to show up. They're going to have to put on, and they're going to have to play well against the Pitt Panthers in Pittsburgh with the fourth game of the season. Now, ESPN has this game at 50.4% chance in favor of Pittsburgh winning, and I think that this is actually a fair assessment. It's Carolina's first true away game, um, and it's kind of in one of those weird situations where it's in Heinz Stadium or uh, Acrisure or whatever it's called now. Um, But... I still like Drake May with his weapons. And I still like Drake May in year two, Mac Brown's fifth year, um, Gene Chizik's second year in the defense. I like Mac or Mac and Drake um, in a close football game, closer than last year. I think it's going to be closer than last year. Uh, but I just think that this is a year where this is not going to be the game, if any game, that's going to steer Carolina in the wrong direction. So I have the Hills improving to 4-0 going into the bye week, and I think that the Carolina Tar Hills will win by at least a touchdown. So September 30th, uh, well-placed bye game. Uh, Give them a nice rest because that's a pretty intense first four of the season, if you will. There's a lot to be excited about there. Now, another game, October 7th, it really doesn't do much for me. Um, except for the fact that it should be a great opportunity for Carolina to get another W, especially in the Atlantic Coast Conference, especially because there's no longer any divisions, is the Q's come to Chapel Hill. Now, the series is tied 3-3 all time. In the last matchup, UNC beat the Q's 31-6 in Chapel Hill uh, two years ago. So, uh, they do return quarterback Garrett Schrader, who passed for 2,640 passing yards and 17 touchdowns and 7 interceptions. Uh, But they do lose Sean Tucker, um, a lot of production to replace. Now, they do bring back a Rondé Gatson tight end, who almost had 1,000 yards receiving, 6 touchdowns. Um, But that could prove to be a matchup problem for the Hills. So, I still really like UNC's first two ACC games to establish the momentum. ESPN has the Tar Heels at a 69.7% chance of beating the Qs. I think it should be a little higher than that myself. I'll take the Hills big to move 5-0, 2-0 on the season. And then that brings in Miami. So October 14th, the Miami Hurricanes come to Chapel Hill. And UNC leads this all-time series 13-11. to But that's not including the two additional wins that UNC had to vacate in 08 and 09 for improper benefits violations. Now, including, this is also including last year's nail biter where UNC won 27-24 to over the Bulldogs in 2009. Straight into the embracing arms of DeAndre Boykins. Oh, it was so sweet to seal the win. 27-24 to in Miami. Now, Carolina's had Miami's number. They've beaten the Miami Hurricanes four years in a row. 
Um, but I'm not going to lie. I'm really glad that this game is in Chapel Hill this year because you never know when that ugly Miami head is going to decide to show itself. Now, there's a lot of controversy as in to whether TVD, Tyler Van Dyke, was going to return to Miami. He ultimately does return. Uh, he had 1,800 passing yards last year with 10 touchdowns and 5 interceptions. And, um, you know, a lot of people, like I said, thought that he was going to take his talents elsewhere. But even though TVD returns, the Canes lack any really proven commodity at the wide receiver position. So they're bringing in a new offensive coordinator, Shannon Dawson, after firing Josh Gaddis. I wish they would have kept Josh. That was good for Carolina. And he'll attempt to install an air raid offense, um, and only time will tell if Tyler Van Dyke is going to be able to have any continuity with these guys as far as that new system is concerned. Now, Mario Cristobal also turns to Lance Guidry to uh, head his defense as Kevin Steele departed for the Alabama Crimson Tide. They do return uh, Cameron Kitchens, who was an All-American, uh, but they do have to replace Tyreek Stevenson and DJ Ivey. So, they got high four-star and five-star talent all across the board in Miami. I don't think anybody can put it put a put a thumb on why they're not good. Um, I mean, they've been through multiple coaching staffs. They always recruit extremely well as far as the rankings are concerned, um, but they just can't put it together on the field. So it'll be interesting to see what they do this year. ESPN has UNC with a 64.1% chance of beating the Canes. I think that that's probably slightly a little higher than my confidence level is. But I'll take the Hills in a tight one, kind of just like last year. And uh, I believe that if Carolina's 5-0 and and Miami's coming to town, you can bet that Chapel Hill will be rocking to watch the undefeated Tar Heels. And Carolina will move to 6-0, and 3-0 and on the season. Now, real quick before we move on, I just want to make a shout-out. Hey, Coach Coop. If you guys don't know him, YouTube Coach Coop, big Miami fan, does great work and everything. Hey, Coach Coop, holler at me, dude. Love to talk to you. So, October 21st at Virginia after the Miami game. Virginia was 3-7, and 1-6 and in the ACC. They did not play in a bowl game last year. Now, UNC leads the all-time series 63-55 to and four ties in the South's oldest rivalry, including last year's 31-28 win by the Tar Heels, and Chapel Hill. Once again, Virginia was atrocious. I think 28 points is the second most points that they put on anybody all year, and of course they would decide to do that against Carolina's defense, which was just really bad. 28 points against Virginia, unacceptable. And to win by three points at home, uh, given all, everything that was going on, you know, all the hype that was being built around them, you know, once again, Carolina plays to the level of their competition. Now, they had one of the worst offenses last year in the entire nation, UVA did. Now, here's the thing. Brennan Armstrong went from a team that I don't like, Virginia, to a team that I despise, NC State. So he's not there anymore. So he transfers over to NC State. So they have to replace not only their quarterback, but they got to replace their top four receivers. And apparently from... All accounts that I've been able to see, Tony Musket, who is a uh, he's a FCS from a S FCS transfer from Monmouth or Monmouth, however you want to pronounce it, uh, he's probably going to get the nod at the quarterback position. So the UVA offense could be stinking worse than it was this year. So they better not hang twenty eight on Carolina again, or there some stinking heads need a roll. Now Cameron Kelly, he transferred from UNC to UVA. Hey, best of luck to you unless you're playing the heels, obviously. But their defense is much better than their offense, but it's not going to be nearly enough for the Hoos to hang with the Hills in Chapel Hill. ESPN gives UNC an 86.2% chance of beating UVA. I like those numbers, and I have your North Carolina Tar Heels moving to 7-0, 7-0, 4-0 in the stinking ACC. It's big time, baby. October 28th, the Tar Heels play at Georgia Tech. Georgia Tech was 5-7, and 4-4 four and four in the ACC. Now, this is a team that, just like Carolina has had Miami's number, it seems like Georgia Tech has had Carolina's number. I don't know what the heck is going on with this, but every time we play Georgia Tech, they seem to throw a wrench in what we're trying to do during that season. So, last year, obviously, 
the Yellow Jackets come into Chapel Hill. Carolina's 9-1. and 9-1. and one. Number 13 in the entire country. And everybody and their mom is talking about Drake May and how he's this dark horse Heisman contender. And what, what happens? Carolina jumps out to a 17-0 lead. And Georgia Tech, with like zero offensive weapons, especially the quarterback position, ends up coming back and beating Carolina 21-17 in Chapel Hill. In stinking Chapel Hill. And, you know, obviously you, you can't help but forget, and it shouldn't have never been in that position in the first place, but our most reliable receiver, Josh Downs, drops the touchdown pass in the end zone that would have put Carolina up. And they would have ended up winning that game just like they won seven, eight games before then, uh, you know, by less than a touchdown, if you will. But that that's one of those games where you're sitting there watching it, you're home, you're up big, and Carolina finds a way to stink and drop the ball. Literally. Not just figuratively speaking, literally. And you're thinking, you know, this is what it means to be a Carolina fan. You know, and you just you just it's almost it's it's almost unbelievable. You just you can't make it up. You you just can't make it up. So Carolina's gonna have a a great opportunity to go down to Atlanta and get some stinking revenge. Georgia Tech leads the all-time series 32 to 21 with three ties. Um, and like I said, Carolina was up 17 to nothing last year with everything in the world to play for, and they end up dropping that game at home. So just absolutely disgusting. Georgia Tech has got to replace everybody. Um, so this should not be a game that Carolina uh, has to struggle in. It shouldn't. It really shouldn't. And I think that Carolina gets revenge. I think that they go to Atlanta, they handle business. ESPN has the heels with a 74.4% chance, percent chance to beat Georgia Tech, and I like that number. I have the Tar Heels going to 8-0, 5-0 in the ACC. Now, November 4th, we're not going to spend much time on this because it is what the, uh, the perennial cupcake, if you will, the Campbell Fighting Campbells, the Campbell, Campbell, Campbell Fighting Camels, from Bowie's Creek, North Carolina, they come into Chapel Hill. Uh, they'll be they were five and six and two and three in the Big South. And UNC and Campbell have never met on the gridiron. So this is obviously a perfect spot for this game because Carolina, the last three games of this their uh, season are they're pretty tough. And uh, this is a good opportunity to get some of the starters. They'll get in for maybe a quarter or a half, run up the score, get some secondary guys in, and uh, give them some burn. And I just get rested up for the gauntlet that is to come, which is the last quarter of the season. Carolina goes to 9-0, 5-0 in the ACC. Now, this is where it gets exciting, okay? November 11th, November 11th, the Duke Blue Devils come in to Chapel Hill. Now, this is a Duke team that last year was 9-4. Five and three in the ACC, and they beat UCF in the Military Bowl, thirty to thirteen. Elko has things going on over there. Okay, so don't you even think for one second that this is some cupcake game that shouldn't be a big deal. Last year in Durham, Carolina won off of a tip drill when Will Hardy got the game sealing interception. Okay, so it took a big play to seal that victory for Carolina. And let's not forget. That stadium, they did a great job of making that an entertaining atmosphere. It was rocking. You know, they were rocking in, in Wallace Wade, and uh, it was a fun football game to watch. So UNC leads the all-time series 63-41 to with three ties in the battle for the victory bell. This is going to be a really big game in that Duke returns Riley Leonard, who almost passed for 3,000 yards, 20 touchdowns, and six interceptions, and... The thing about Duke is they are returning almost everybody. So that nine-win football season that they had last year, all those guys are back in a year better. So this is, once again, not a stinking cupcake. Uh, they're returning all three of their starting receivers, Eli Pankel, Jalen Calhoun, and Jordan Moore. And Calhoun is a baller. You know, that guy, he's just a really good football player, and he is a matchup problem every single year since he's been there. They combined for 1,876 yards receiving and nine touchdowns, and they also returned their senior running back, Jalen Coleman, who had 483 running, rushing yards and four touchdowns, and Jordan Waters. And let's not forget that Riley Leonard 
he rushed for 700 yards himself and 13 touchdowns. So this is a formidable team. The defense cut their uh, points per game from almost 40 in 21 to 22.1 in 22. If Carolina can make that jump, if Carolina can get down to 21, 22 points a game on defense, hey, watch out. But, you know, there you go. These guys did it. Carolina has yet to do it, and that's what we're hoping for in 2023. So well-coached football team, man. And where they lack in talent, they play hard. And, you know, that's where Carolina is going to have to pick it up. They're going to have to take this one serious, and they're going to have to handle stinking business. So uh, this is actually, um, I'm thinking of a game that I'm for sure going to attend, and uh, I think that this might be the one. I think it should be a really good football game. So ESPN gives UNC a 77% chance of beating Duke. I think that that number's much too high. Um, but I think that Carolina does have a little bit too much firepower at home in a close game, moving UNC, get this, to 10-0. 10-0, 6-0 in the ACC. You say, I don't, I don't understand how it's possible. Well, look at the schedule. I mean, am I saying that Carolina is like, you know, the new Georgia or Alabama? No, that's not what I'm saying. That's not even what I would be close to implying. What I'm implying is, is that with the schedule that is in front of them, Carolina should be 10 and 0, period. Now, right after that Duke game, <clears throat> guess what we have? The undefeated Tar Heels go into Death Valley and play the Clemson Tigers on November 18th, obviously on national television. Now, Clemson last year was 11-3, and 9-0 in the ACC, and they were the ACC champs because, like I said, they, they punished Carolina last year. Clemson leads the all-time series 39-19 with one loss, uh, including that game last year. Now, they return eight guys on offense, including former Tar Heel target Will Shipley, who rushed for almost 1,200 yards and 15 touchdowns. And then they also returned sophomore Cade Klubnik. Now, let me tell you something. When I was at that game last year, the ACC championship game, if DJU plays the rest of that football game, Carolina may have been the ACC champions. But then Cade Klubnik comes in and completely changes the football game around, and he abused the Tar Heels. He gave Clemson so much life in that ACC championship game, Carolina almost didn't have a chance. So it'll be interesting to see what this kid does with a full offseason under his belt and that he is the starting quarterback. A lot of Clemson people are excited about this guy, especially after DJU took his – talents, if you will, to Oregon State. Um, so that was it. Klubnik was a huge part of running the Tar Heels out of Bank of America last year. So I'm hoping that he has some, sort of a sophomore slump. No offense, Cade. But Clemson's bringing in a new offensive coordinator in Garrett Riley from TCU. Um, but by this juncture of the season, he will have had an ample amount of time to get the passing game going. So that's not something that is really going to affect this football game because we're 10 games in by now. They also return uh, Antonio Williams, who had 600 receiving yards and four touchdowns, and junior tight end Jake Brininstool, 285 yards and four touchdowns. Now here's where Clemson's strength is going to be, okay? Because you got Cade and you got Will, and those are both really good options on the offensive side of the football, but the Clemson defense is going to be stinking stout. They got eight starters coming back led by linebackers Barrett Carter and Jeremiah Trotter, and uh, their entire secondary will be back. Um, so it's going to be a real de a difficult defense to, to crack. So ESPN has Clemson with an 81.1% chance of beating the Hills, and I would say that obviously I agree with that. Uh, Carolina's going to lose in Death Valley. Now, obviously I think they have a puncher's chance, but I think this is Carolina's first loss of the season and they lose in Death Valley by 10. And uh, But what I will say is, I believe that the schedule that Clemson plays, the schedule that Florida State plays, I think that this here is a preview of what you're going to see a couple weeks later in the ACC championship game. So Carolina goes to 10-1, and 6-1 in the ACC, and then they follow that battle up with a trip to NC State. Now, 
that's tough. That's a tough sled right there, man. You play Duke in a rivalry game, then you play in Death Valley. You take your first L, and now you have to go to Raleigh and try to seek some vengeance for the past couple of years against the Wolfpack. So, NC State last year was 8-5. and five. They were 4-4 four and four in the ACC, and they lost to the Terps in the Dukes Mayo Bowl 16-12. Way to go, Maryland. Wish you were still in the ACC like you should be. But UNC leads the all-time series 68-38 to in six ties, including last year's double overtime loss. 30 to 27 in Chapel Hill. And once again, NC State had a stinking third string quarterback in, and he was able to come into Chapel Hill and get a W. You know, once again, Carolina playing to their competition. Carolina was so much more of a better football team than the NC State Wolfpack. They were better than Georgia Tech, they were better than NC State. Okay, they were not better than Clemson, and they should have beat Oregon. This this whole 10 win thing. Should have been accomplished last year, Um, but I digress. So, NC State brings in senior UVA transfer Brennan Armstrong, and this guy is going to replace Devin Leary, and he has been a problem in Carolina's side since he was at Virginia. Um, You know, everybody's talking about how this guy is an NFL talent. I don't know about all that, but he is a really good college football player. Um, so he goes from playing with UVA to he decides to take his talents down to play for little brother in Raleigh. And, um, you know, I hope that Carolina gets up for this one as they should. So NC State returns uh, senior running back Jordan Houston, who had 544 yards and zero touchdowns, along with senior wide receiver Keon Lassane, 342 yards, two touchdowns. So there's not a ton of returning production for Armstrong to work with, uh, but the Tar Heel faithful can, they they definitely understand the myriad of headaches Brennan's given UNC over the past few years. The guy just finds a way to be a thorn in our side. Now, the defense does return at starting 22 defensive line and Devin Van, CJ Clark, and Savion Jackson. And they additionally return senior Peyton Wilson, who, you know, what Tar Heel likes that guy along with quarterback Shaheen Battle and Aiden White. I was actually watching a clip yesterday of Peyton. I think it was like his freshman or sophomore year getting pancaked by one of the Carolina offensive linemen, and it's just uh, it's a beautiful thing. You know, just YouTube uh, Peyton Wilson getting pancaked, you know, you'll see it. It's pretty good. ESPN gives UNC a 51.1% chance to beat the Wolfpack in Raleigh. I think it's going to be a super close game because – this is one of the most underrated rivalries in football. It seems like every year there's some kind of stinking fight that stops the game because these guys hate each other so much. And, I mean, it's genuine hatred on both sides as far as the football game is concerned. Um, so UNC has lost the last two to state, and they have a ton to play for right now. You know, they're 10-1. and one. They just had a, a hard-fought loss to Clemson. And then they have an opportunity to get revenge against NC State for the past couple of years of losing to them. And I think that's exactly what they're going to do. I think Carolina's got too much, and they go into Raleigh and get a little bit of revenge. And that moves Carolina to 11-1, and 7-1 and in the ACC, and they will be, get this, playing for another ACC championship game. And I actually have them against the Clemson Tigers. A lot of guys are on the Florida State Seminoles. I think Florida State is going to have a fantastic year, but one of the good things is Carolina doesn't have to play Florida State, and Carolina's schedule seems to set them up for being able to have one of the better records in the Atlantic Coast Conference, at least one of the top two records in the ACC. So I have Carolina going 11-1, 7-1, and playing an ACC championship game, and then I want you to understand, I want you to get this. Mac Brown is going to... Help the Tar Heels win the 2023 ACC Championship game when they get revenge playing Clemson in Bank of America and then Carolina's going to be a playoff team. Laugh laugh if you want. Laugh if you want. But I'm calling it right here. This schedule, like I said, I want to preface everything with this has nothing to do with Carolina being Georgia or Alabama or 
That's not what this is about. This is about the schedule that's put in front of them. And it's manageable, and you have Mac Brown, and you have a quiet confidence in Chapel Hill that is going to spell for a really big football season. If he doesn't do it this year, it's not going to get done. Because Drake May's leaving, Cedric Gray's leaving, you're going to have a lot of people leaving the program either because they've graduated, they're going to the NFL, et cetera, et cetera. So this is the year. And this is not even just, you know, necessarily, at least I don't believe it is, a biased. I mean, I think this is an educated looking at what Carolina brings back and the schedule that is in front of them. This is the year that they should have. Now, I will also say this. I have two asterisks by two of the football games, okay? Did I give you what I think is going to happen? Yes. I'm going to put an asterisk by South Carolina, okay? And I'm going to put an asterisk by NC State, the first and the last game of the season. Those are the two where I could say, okay, it could go either way. So now you got a 9-3 and three Carolina, and you got a 10-2, and 11-1. Nine wins being the floor, okay? And that's obviously before the bowl game. But... I do believe that Carolina has learned a lot over the last couple of years. You don't see the hype that they had in 2020 when they were a top 10 team going into Virginia Tech and everybody was saying that they were going to be a dark horse national contender. You don't have that hype right now. They're quietly behind the scenes putting everything together and they're going to show everybody on September 2nd. So with that being said, let me know. In the comments section, what do you think? Hey, if you think I'm stinking out in outer space, let me know. I would love to talk about it. If you think that I'm on to something, hey, put it down in the comment section, baby. I'm asking for all my Tar Heels. Realistically speaking, where do you see this season going? Seven wins, eight wins. Is it going to be 11? Do we have a shot at beating Clemson and Death Valley? Tell me about it down in the comment section. But this has been your 2023 North Carolina football preview, and I'm your boy Russ, and I'm saying to you right now, baby, that the Carolina Tar Heels are going to win the ACC in 2023. Go Heels.